to heart to hearties. It's the Monday after the season finale, and we're all here to talk all about it. I'm Lori Pearson from Mobile, Alabama, and I'm joined today by my friends. I'm Marg Stark from San Diego, California. Hi there, I'm Jeanette from Michigan. And here she is, our showrunner, Lindsay Sturman. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Oh, we're so glad you're here. So let me just get things started off with a comment from Kristen Barnes of Kenosha, Wisconsin. And she said, thank you, Brian, Lindsay, and all the writers and producers for an amazing season 10, for the stories and adventures you have taken us on. I look forward to what is ahead for these characters and for the stories and adventures you all will continue to take the Hardys on and the lessons you will teach our hearts. That means so much. Thank you. It, it's, I was, the response was so, there were so many wonderful responses and people were, were reaching out online and DMing and, um, you know, you're, you're just lucky to write for a show like this. It's, it's really rare where the, the fans are so passionate and care so much. And I, I think we've talked about this before is that it's so rare to have a community talking online during the show. So that is, it's just really thrilling. Well, it was definitely an emotional roller coaster. And we've got, you know, some Hardys that just wanted that roller coaster to just keep on going and ready to go right into season 11. Some of them, you know, they're still reeling a little bit from the events of these last two episodes. So they, they may need to sit off the ride for a little while and just process what all went on. So we're going to take a closer look today at how you writers crafted that wonderful roller coaster for all of us. So you wrote the season finale that we watched last night and it truly felt like you left nothing, you know, everything was left on that page. Everything was covered. At the outset, we learned that the election was the very next day and it was the very same day as Lucas and Elizabeth's wedding was supposed to be. That is awkward. And that awkwardness just seemed to carry over throughout the town and into Elizabeth's classroom. Let's talk about the kids first. Why was it important for you to show how the kids, even little Jack, would be affected? And how did you decide which kids would be most confused or disconcerted by it all? Yeah, I, I mean, for Elizabeth, being a teacher is one of the most important things in her life. And we wanted to really show how it would realistically affect everybody in the town and that there would be reactions and that this gave her a chance to reassure her students and kind of reassure herself. And I think reassure the audience that, that she's okay, even if she's sad, even if things are not perfect. And having people react authentically to it, it also let us show that Elizabeth's okay and that her relationship with Lucas is okay. And I think that that's, you know, things can go wrong in life, right? But they don't have to end terribly or awkwardly. Things can be painful for a moment, you know, a rupture and then a repair as you kind of move through into like a different chapter. And it's, I think that it's also the message that I think Brian was talking about recently is that it's okay to call off an engagement. That's what it's for. You have a long engagement so that you can make this huge decision. And I think sometimes people don't see it that way, but I think it, you know, in some ways we really should treat it that way, that it's totally fine. And, and rushing into something is not always the best decision so that you, you can take a pause. She, 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 she followed her heart and she made this really painful decision, but in Hope Valley that the community is so special and unique that you can really stay friends. And I think that's what, what those scenes were about telling, telling that part of the story. And Rosie and Elizabeth sure tried to, to normalize all that awkwardness and get everyone focused just on the election, not on what was going on with Elizabeth, and played that with so much comic relief. Oh, yeah, they're, they're so brilliant together. And, and letting them play the awkwardness, it was, uh, th there are times when you, you get those scenes back and you're just, yeah, it was, it was wonderful. So, and Lucas's face is plastered everywhere all over town giving new meaning to the phrase in your face so and mike poor mike mike hickam's covering up lucas's poster was absolutely hysterical leaning up against it everyone cares so much about elizabeth's feelings and yet elizabeth says she's fine indeed we counted that she that fine was repeated 11 times this episode tell us about the little subliminal messages there 
Yeah, I think she's not exactly fine. And that's why she's saying it. Um, and, you know, it, it is, it's it's awkward. It's a heartbreak. She's sad. She knows she made the right decision. And Elizabeth's also one of those incredibly evolved characters. She's so wise and kind. And Lucas is also so wise and, and, and such a mature person. And the idea that they are, they're going to put the town first. They always put the town first. And this is a moment of crisis. Um, so she she has to put aside her feelings and telling everyone she's fine and Rosemary kind of helping her do that is their way of just putting the town first and doing what has to be done, which is get, getting through the election. I think Rosie, didn't Rosie even go, and that's what we'll keep telling people. Like she like reassured her like, okay, we'll keep, we'll keep up with this ruse for the moment. For her. That's what a best friend does. She's, she's yeah. right there with her. <laughs> but it was, it was great. I thought it was a kind of a neat, device and didn't you at one point Jeanette tweet that you thought we should turn it into a drinking game How I, many... did. I did I did take, take a shot at a time someone yeah, maybe that was fine. appropriate yes I love it <laughs> um speaking of drinking uh Lee and Bill in the bar I mean the male friendships uh the whole season really it was really a highlight for me um but this episode really delivered the male friendships in spades too. I just, between, you know, Bill accompanying Nathan to go after the Pinkertons and policing the injunctions and, um, and all of it. Um, Gail Kiko of Lemon Grove, California said, Bill just made her laugh last night while Lee and Bill were tending bar for Hickam. Fiona said to Mike, you have to tell her how you feel. How is she supposed to know if you don't say anything? At which point Bill and Lee said, good luck with that. Uh, what was your favorite bromance of the night? I, I love that everyone's picking up on our, our, the male friendship and the, the, you know, the season of friendship. Um, Cause you know, it's, 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 you don't always see that on TV, people just having authentic friendships. And, you know, I, I love them all for sort of different reasons. I, I love you know, Lee and Henry um, being, you know, just how, how authentic Lee yeah. and Henry, it's such a real friendship. And then you've got, you know, Bill and Nathan, you know, cause their, their heads are in different places. They've, they're, they're, you know, they're going out to look for Pinkertons when they're really just nervous about, you know, a little, um, you know, uh, 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 off kilter and then they can be there for each other, but they probably never admit that, but that's kind of what they're doing ever, ever. Yes. And then you've got Lee and and Bill pinch hitting for Hickam. And I, I just love that, you know, everybody in the town will roll up their sleeves and, you know, clean a glass. They're never above just helping, you know, helping their friends. So yeah, I, 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 I love, I love a show where it's so rare to have a show where you really can show friendships and, and male friendships. And, um, and there's so many characters you can keep, you know, finding different ways for people to be friends. Yeah, different odd couples. That that definitely I picked up on that. I wasn't sure if it was like, you know, Bill and Nathan were like classic cop partners or whether that's odd couple or what, but it just it just totally worked. I really enjoyed it. And then John Serrata last night, uh, the little uh, I don't know, his banjo or pedal steel or guitar, whatever that was, that little flourish that he plays with with Bill and Nathan was just hysterical. And there's so many other points that we'll bring up, but I just thought his music added so much um, depth last night. It really did. So then, of course, we have Madeline showing up in one of the later scene and she parks in front of the hitching post again. Um, just a sweet little flirty joke, even between somebody who's really hurt Bill. Um, but I did think we might have a kiss, you know, could you tell us, was there a kiss ever written in or were there any kisses that were left on the cutting room floor this season that we should know about? No, but, but maybe we should have, but they, they, <laughs> they're, they're on screen chemistry in that moment. is just, yeah, she was, they were fantastic. Yeah. And for the record, Hardy 101 is that no kisses should ever end up on a cutting room floor ever. <laughs> Just right. putting that plug in there. We, we yes, like we'd like them all. We would you, like them. Remember that movie Cinema Paradiso? Of course. The end, they, they put all the kisses together that they've edited out of the, <laughs> the movies because 
<laughs> nothing can have a kiss. If there are any, I'll try to track them down and maybe there should we be We need them all. <laughs> right, exactly yes. right. So we want to pivot to another new couple um, on the scene, uh, May and Mike, or Hickam, as many of us know him as. Um, I just personally think they're the cutest. And I think a lot of Hardys are on, on the ship. Um, one hearty, Mandy Spitler, who's from Lake Charles, Louisiana, said, your voice is my favorite sound. That line that Hickam delivered was one of the most romantic things she's heard. Um, so can you talk to us a little bit about how it occurred to the writers to kind of go this direction? And we'd also love to hear what the actors thought when you first pitched them the idea. Yeah, a lot of what you do when you're writing a show this far in is you look at old threads and, you know, just storylines. And sometimes the actors bring something to a scene that you didn't, that the writer didn't intend, like they just take it in another direction. And w watching Hickam and May together, you, you know, as it, the stories were unfolding over the season, it also becomes very circular because you're writing way ahead, but you're seeing the earlier episodes get shot. And then you sort of start to, it, it changes where you go very often because you're like, you see, oh my God, there's this spark. And that scene in the cafe where Minnie and Rosemary are putting them together as a duet. And, you know, May is so embarrassed and Nickham is so excited. I just, you you live for scenes like that because it, it, it you know, the, the writing was lovely. And then it's like the acting just takes it to a whole nother level. And you can't predict a spark that, you know, that they have. Um, but then as we were writing, it just kept getting, you know, and, and they were really open to it. Of course, we run all the stuff by the actors and, you know, um, they, they were really thrilled. And then, of course, as the story unfolded, we also have a, a, a cast of just incredible singers. That was one of the reasons the choir made so much sense. Um, so that was hilarious because they're, you know, and, and, and Ben is just an incredibly trained singer, but but Amanda's really great too, so. Well, and especially thinking back too, he was in those scenes, he, he was like so supportive of her and trying to encourage her and which is like such a great foundation for, for a relationship too, so. Um, that so maybe they weren't surprised when you came to them because they were kind of seeing it too. Um, that's really neat. and that choir thing. Let's keep that going because Hardy's love sings, send them sing. Oh, god, <laughs> yes, <laughs> music is just adds so much. And to your mm -hmm. comment about John, I mean, he's just it's like his talent, I mean, what he adds to the show. I mean, I when you see the rough cut and then you see what he does and it's so subtle, you don't even, you don't even no notice that it's taking you, just making you feel more. And then the way he added this little light of mine into some of the background music. Mm -hmm. that, and then the all through the night. All through the night. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Just beautiful. Stunning. Well, we uh, want to pivot a little bit. Uh, so Lucas and Elizabeth talk for the first time after the breakup. So this is the first we're seeing Lucas in the episode. Um, and it's sort of surprising how composed they are. Um, a hearty Erica Legrand Robertson of St. Petersburg, Florida, found them restrained in, in their emotions, um, even back to the breakup scene from last, last episode. She wondered why there was not more discussion between them or more emotion. Can you talk a little bit about how you approached that scene? It was, it sort of felt, and it's even more difficult because you're going from there's just a week between, right? So you're kind of ripping the Band-Aid off and then Hardy's are, are are jumping into a new episode. Yeah, I, I have to check, but I think it's three, is it three weeks? I think that it was- One week for yeah. us and three weeks for, yeah. 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 for, them. Yeah. for Hope Valley. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it, you know, Lucas obviously had this arc from, you know, as we talked about, you know, Prince Hal, this, you know, um, happy-go-lucky, you know, guy who, who you know, starts to become sort of this member of the community and then takes on the weight of the world is on his shoulders. And that was always the balance is that Elizabeth and Lucas and the whole town understand the importance of that. And that's one of the reasons that, you know, they're just, they're prioritizing that because that's the crisis of the moment. And I think that's why it's, it's more subdued. And I think it's also subdued in the sense that they, they, they sort of, they're just maturity and that they've, you know, were able to, to, to not create um unnecessary um 
conflict and stress in this moment where they have to step up and do so much. So I think that was sort of the approach of, um, and then, you know, seeing him sort of in his element, um, you know, in this, obviously he's in some place where he's, you know, he's got the fancy phone and he's obviously, you know, doing big things that are, you know, tremendously, you know, he's in a different world already. Um, and I think that weight is sort of on his shoulders. Well, it was lovely to see him talk about that he's found his calling and then um, feeling relieved when she's sort of said that she, you know, I'm still here supporting you. She didn't use those words, but her, you know, her, her conversations implied that. So that was nice to see that they were still, still a team to some degree. So, yeah. yeah. So keeping on Elizabeth, those two scenes between Elizabeth and Henry were just so well written and so beautifully acted. I love the exchange when Elizabeth says, we all blow things up sometimes. It felt as though she was acknowledging that she, the hurt that she had caused. Yeah, I think a little bit of that. And, you know, she, she never would have wanted to hurt anybody, including Lucas. And I think that Elizabeth, you can see in that scene sort of, you know, on her face, everything that she's been going through. And, and she obviously has this, you know, just heartbreaking past. And I think that she is in the moment where she's, she's talking to him. It's, he knows he overstepped. And I think that makes him open to these words of wisdom that she's sharing. And maybe she wouldn't normally have shared and maybe he wouldn't normally have been open to it, but in that moment he can hear her. And I think it obviously changes the direction that he takes. Can I just say in that scene, I really loved that they've I mean 10 years is this relationship between the two of them and I loved that it, they've never really talked use the word our friendship or your friendship means a lot to me or I loved that there was this moment of acknowledgement of how much the two of them really mean to each other and when you think about all they've been through and seeing especially this season see that relationship grow it was just it was lovely to finally see them say you know what your friendship means a lot to me and that they both said it it was just Special. Yeah, and warmed, and warmed my hearty it, heart. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a little formal, but I, I love that it's both formal and it's so warm and, and so genuine. Well, and then she got him in his beautiful coat again because yes. he's been out of that coat all season. So to have him approach in that coat, to have it be at night, to have Elizabeth be as pensive and mel and a bit melancholy as she was and the stars in the sky, the gorgeous little piano um, flourish that um, that John included, and then going to all through the night. It just it it just really was beautiful. The symbolism of the coat, because the coat was very much like a symbol of his villain status back in the day. So the full circle moment that now that that's not at all what it represents was really neat. Yeah, I like he finally maybe comfortable with who he is and has put to rest that bad guy from a couple of years ago I like that I like that a lot uh, and continuing with that you know with Henry in his office Henry says and I want to get this right because that was that that was so beautiful Henry said I've spent my life trying to escape that shack separate myself from these people people like those 47 men they were numbers in my ledger and I sent them into the mine so that I could wear a fancy hat. I lived in the darkness so long that I couldn't see beauty anymore. But sitting here across the street helped me see it again. The view hasn't changed from here, but I have. Tell us about that beautiful scene and those beautiful words. Yeah, I actually texted with Martin this morning about it because... Um, I, I wanted to know if he's okay with me sharing this, but I, I, I actually wrote that speech. It was the first thing I wrote because um, I, I, I just, I, I always felt that was sort of his story of, and it was, it was a very rough version of that idea of him, you know, coming to this, putting it all together. And, and we went back and forth a lot and he actually wrote pieces of it and took would take pictures and I'd incorporate and we went back and forth and and the sh the line about the shack that was all him and it, I just thought it was so beautiful and it's so lucky as a writer because these actors know their character so well that they're you know that we can collaborate and and I love when a, an actor gives me a better line right because I'm like great um so 
it, it really was this, you know, it was this just really, for me, a really wonderful collaboration and really, you know, just one in a million working with him. Um, and then, you know, it's the story, obviously, of his arc. And I think that him looking at Abigail's was, that was about that he's, you know, he, he was a villain. And just an amazing thing about the show. And that was one of the things that I just blew me away when I first saw it is that he is such a villain. And as a viewer, I forgave him. And then you go back and you look at it and you cannot believe that you could forgive someone for what he did. And, and the town is full of so much kindness. And so you have, you know, obviously he's working through, he's making amends by blowing up the mind. And then he, you know, gets forgiveness. And we see that through the Rosaline story. But there's still Abigail still out there. It's sort of the person that he harmed the most probably and you know has and she she forgave him long ago that's what's so beautiful about this town and about her but that he still hasn't taken that final step so that was I think him ruminating you know on on how his journey his journey is not done that heartbreaking scene where she goes to the little notches on the door where she's raised her kids and you know she wants to open the cafe but his demand was that she leave that home I mean he really was awful, mm. awful. Mm. Um, so it is amazing to see him come that far and to be yes, a godfather. It has been quite the journey of forgive, forgiveness, which we're going to keep talking about that thing. It was incredible that we felt like the whole christening service from the music through the message. We got to see all of that. Leah Turner of Ohio said, When Calls the Heart has the most talented cast and creative team. It's the best way to end my weekend. And my only complaint is that we don't have more episodes. I am so grateful all the time spent on forgiveness this season. Tell us about this. We worked really closely with a pastor on everything that all the sermons and, and with Brian Bird, because, you know, the faith aspect of the show is so important to him. And, and it's really important to me and to a lot of people. And we we wanted to show that what kind of world is Goldie going to grow up in? And it's a community that cares and this sort of idea of the community of kindness. And, and of course it also picked up the thread of forgiveness, which is at the heart of the whole show um, from, from day one, the, you know, the Hope Valley is a place that is forgiving. Um, and, and, and pulling it all together as a way to sort of, it's not, I don't think it's the end of, Henry Gowan's journey. There's there's more to, you know, to his journey, but that you could pull pull it all together in this sort of idea of forgiveness. And this really came from Brian Bird is that it's a way that we find grace. And I just remember when he said that to me and I was like, that is, for me, that just resonated so much is, you know, the, the power of that and the idea of grace. So, and then Viv, just, you know, everything he does is, is just so powerful. Lucas wins the election, which was, of course, the outcome that we needed for Hope Valley. He comes out of his campaign office after thanking, presumably, his campaign workers or whoever. Um, why am I forgetting our, the gentleman's name who served as his aide? Edwin. Edwin, yes. Edwin must have quickly gathered some some workers. He's in the headlights saying what are you doing here? What in the world happens? Is he kidnapped? Is he hurt? What, what is happening? I think we'll all have to wait for season 11. Oh, It'll be oh, that we, I love that we thought she would actually answer that. <laughs> be more guessing online. So, um, but oh, yeah, yeah. We, we wanted a cliffhanger, right? Cause it's, you know, and it's one of several of the cliffhangers, but also we, it's so we didn't want to, we don't want to do a story where Lucas is in capital city, you know, being a governor and it's all great. Like that's obviously not going to be the story. So we wanted to set things up that we can pay off in the, in the next season. So, um, and you know, the idea that his past is in his past, he's become, you know, famous, at least in the, you know, in the region, if not in the country, if not in the world. So, you know, what did happen in his past and will that come back? And then, of course, what does that all mean for Elizabeth? Well, I did really feel for him. I mean, you come out, you know, he's been through a lot. And um, to come out, I mean, it's a moment of triumph, of course, but he's alone. And then there's these jarring headlights. And it was it was a cliffhanger. All right. Wow. Obviously, somebody he wasn't expecting to see. 
Yeah. Yeah. And there's, there's, um, I, you know, a lot of times they'll come up with that moment in the, um, in the writer's room. So it's like the writer, you know, doesn't necessarily write the line, but the moment was so packed because there's a lot of different <laughs> secrets in there. So, um, and then that just gives you a lot of mystery to figure out, um, you know, what, it, you know, who was it, you know, what, what is their past? You know, he's not happy to see this person. So what's going on? Why did they come now? My goodness. Well, and Hardys okay. are wondering, is it someone we've seen the viewer before or is it someone we haven't seen? And I would love, to, I actually didn't see that many Hardys guesses. So I would love to, I got to go back and scroll through to see everyone's, Check it out. See everyone's right. guesses. <laughs> Finally, we see Elizabeth ride Sergeant to Jack's gravesite and then to the pond. I think it's a pond or some body of water. There's a log where she and Nathan had had that critical moment back in season eight. And then suddenly Nathan shows up and neither of them seem to be understand why, what brought them there. Um, what, what did bring them there? I think that's again, something for season 11, <laughs> but I, I think they're, they're drawn back to that moment for a reason. And, uh, and there's, yeah, and I think that that it's um, it's complicated, obviously, um, and, and then of course it's interrupted by a new crisis. So right, mm -hmm. it felt almost a little Godwinky, like spiritual. Were we supposed to get that? I think they're I think they're drawn there. I think that's a really fair, and and I think she went up to 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 talk to Jack and and have that moment and then she's just wandering and that's you know they're they they wander to a place yeah so hardies thank you we are going to continue this conversation with part two with both Lindsay and Brian Bird um but thanks for joining us for part one we'll see you soon <laughs>